but it's yet considered on paper as a lower level of education than if you're going for, you know, like high school and then college or, or so on. So it's a shorter cursus in terms of you much quicker reach the, the, the work market and you very much specialize in one specific uh, job. Um, but uh, so, um, yeah, so that's how it works. So you go through catering school. So that's how you do after secondary school, you can go to catering school. You first have to do at least two years, uh, whether in the kitchen or on the floor. And in fact, the first year is actually a mix. Uh, so you do half the time in the kitchen, half the time on the floor. And it's at the end of the first year that you decide what you know side of the restaurant would you want to be in. So you're exposed to everything and then yeah. based, based on your interest, Yes. You choose what you want. Okay, that's exactly. And you have to do some work experiences as well throughout, throughout the year and, and go and work for a few weeks in some restaurants. Um, and then after those two years, you can go for a higher level of education level, uh, certificate in catering, or you can also decide straight away to go to study to become a sommelier. Okay. And depending on the schools, you have also different levels. You can do it in one year. You can um, decide to do a second year, which I think is more dedicated to maybe the studies of foreign wines. And you can also do another certificate, um, which, if I'm correct, is another two years, but you spend half your time working and half your time studying. Wow. So there are lots of different options to become a sommelier in France. <laughs> but I think it's one of the only countries that have this as a part of the... So, you know, state kind of education um, program. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I was just uh, reading something uh, about you before uh, before we had the interview, and uh, uh, th this was very interesting to to have a uh, sommelier as a profession in in high school. Um, basically, uh, I mean, everywhere in the world, you have the position uh, catering schools um, that have waiter positions uh, or or a cook. Uh, and and that's it and then it's a little bit uh, to say the least old-fashioned maybe not to <laughs> not to think about incorporating a sommelier profession and into a, a traditional uh, high school syllabus uh, how would you compare for example um, or what's your uh, comment on you know having such a traditional way of uh, learning uh, to become a sommelier versus uh, WSCT, Wine and Spirit Education Trust, or Court Master Sommelier, or even uh, Sommelier Association, which will be, which will come to, to in the, in the, uh, talking about uh, in the end of, of the interview. Um, so I suppose um, when you're studying to become a somebody in France, you're sorry that I'm giving you such a broad question. That's okay, <laughs> but you you may, you're mostly studying uh, French wines, so you oh. get a very in-depth knowledge of French vineyards, French laws, and so on, um, which obviously is great if you're going to be working in France. But if you're planning to move abroad and have some work experiences abroad, I'm just going to have a sip. It's Sunday, so is this a sparkling wine from North Macedonia? No, no, it's a, it's a, it's a low, it's a, um, one international brand that, that oh. we're importing. It, it's a Spanish cow. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's a very good value. It's not like I'm drinking champagne, you know. Like. Nice. <laughs> I'm on iced coffee, I'm afraid. <laughs> the only thing I would say is that you're going to do your studies in French as well. So throughout the, your, your program, you have a few hours of English you know, within the, the school program, but the level of English you're going to gain is never going to be great. Um, because the best experience, the best way to learn English or to learn any other languages is to move. And there are two ways I would say is whether you find a boyfriend or a girlfriend that speak the language, that's probably the best option. <laughs> or uh, you move to a country where you're going to be immersed in the culture and you have to stay away from, I would say communities or rest workplaces that are going to be uh, with people of your own nationalities because that can be a little bit of a an easy, an easy thing to do and you realize <clears throat> you realize sorry after a year or so that you haven't really progressed as much as you should have in, in the language that you want to study what is great with um court of master sommelier wsct um <clears throat> sorry um, i need to no, clear no, my throat <laughs> Mm, sorry. 
I realize I'm not used to talk so much anymore uh, the last few months. So every time I have an online meeting, this happens. <laughs> yeah, you told so, me. Um, the, it, it's first it's taught in English, which I think is very good because English is going to be a very important language to, to I think, uh, master if, if you want to work as a sommelier and be able to go around and meet people and um, interact with people from all around the world. I think it's important to consider really putting some time and effort in learning English. Also, I suppose, um, those two uh, schools, so WSET and, and uh, Court of Master Sommelier, are really recognized internationally. So once you have their exams, their diploma or, or so on, you know, you put it on your CV and it's probably more well known that if I say I had the Mention Complémentaire Sommelier from France, which is very well recognized in France, which I'm sure people look at it, they're like, okay, she has a certificate from Sommelier in France, but it's not as, it doesn't refer to anything for people. Wow. If you go down the WSET road, um, I'm not entirely sure that it is um, fully dedicated as if you want to work in a restaurant, it might not be the course to go for. I probably would recommend the court of Master Sommelier over the WSET. Here we are again. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, over the WSET. The WSET, I'll tell you what. I actually went through the path of the WSET myself because when you I started your, you finish your diploma and you also have level three in sake right yes exactly um and I absolutely loved it it was first of all you have to learn a lot about uh wine and other and spirits and, and so on but what you learn with the WSET is different to what you're going to learn uh, for a sommelier competition a sommelier exam or the court of master sommelier it's not about knowing all the grand cru classé from this area, or it's actually having a broader understanding of um, why does this wine taste like this? What's the impact of terroir, the impact of, um, I don't know, of clones, of winemaking, of, of the pruning of the, of the climate? So it, it's a kind of a broader and more general um, knowledge you, that you need to acquire. Would, would you say, for example, that WSET gives like a, a more... Um, uh, a playing field or a, a better understanding for people to go, for example, into a more uh, narrow, uh, let's say, speciali spe specialization of, of a region or a country or something like that? Um, it, it's a funny thing because it's like you need to know a lot, but at the same time, for me, when I studied for sommelier, courses or exams or competition i felt like i was zooming into the tiniest of the tiniest of the details yeah you go, you go very deep regarding details exactly but then the question is very direct it's like list all of the commune of production of this thing and you just list yeah. with wsct is it's less in details but there is still a lot to know yeah. but then it's like you need to have this uh, ability to have um a vision of that, the world of wine from above in some way and you have to collect to be able to collect information and put them back together to debate or explain uh, your thinking about what the question is so you have to write a lot and i think it's a very good challenge uh, because it teaches you how to think differently um, and it also teaches you or forces you to improve your uh, writing english because it's in english Court of Master Sommelier, I didn't uh, pursue that, those studies. Uh, I would have loved to, but I reached a point where <laughs> I didn't feel, uh, I, I just thought, okay, you know, if I had been a few years ago, I would have done it, but I don't think I will now. But I think it's for what I've heard for the people I know who, who are studying with this course, uh, it looks like an amazing, you know, program. Uh, it's very thorough and it's a great program um, for people really wanting to work in the restaurant because you've got the practical aspect of service as well. And there are different levels. So I think it's, you should not be worried about, we hear about uh, master sommeliers and probably um, some of you might have seen the, you know, the sums uh, documentary, which, which in some way are very intimidating and I don't think are a very accurate representation of what the profession of sommelier should be because um, yes, you know, you put yourself under pressure, you want to achieve goals when you, when you have a goal and you have to work hard. 
but you can still enjoy life and you know yeah. uh, be relaxed and uh, so don't think about that as a reference i think um they are lower levels to start with where you learn the basics and if you do the work if you enjoy what you're doing it's very reachable you can do it you know and some people want to go further and try the master somebody and that's great but it's not because you're not a master somebody that you're not a good somebody because it's not just about learning everything and knowing everything it's also about personality it's about being uh, very good at diplomacy with customers it's about understanding people it's about communication so being a sommelier it's an all-rounded uh, profession and as i say i often rather deal with somebody with a little less knowledge but the right personality that with somebody who knows everything or thinks they know everything and just you know makes you feel like you just want to drink water after you talk to them <laughs> thank you so, so much for 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 this because uh, it's so refreshing to I mean, not so refreshing, but you know, people uh, think as, as sommeliers as just knowledge, 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 or certificates, certificates, certificates. Mm. But it is it, it, just you know talking to people and being hospitable in 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 a plain uh, to say it in a plain way. Uh, Master sommelier Bobby Stucky, he told me he you know he came to a point he finished his uh, MS. Uh, but he says he, he never, you know, wears the pin uh, when he's working in a restaurant. He's just like, he describes himself as, you know, a hosp uh, uh, hospitality guy that, you know, happens to uh, own a restaurant. And it's just a humble way of uh, this describing uh, uh, who he is. But, you know, uh, I would say, you know, to be humble, it's one of the virtues uh, that, you know, I don't know. No, no one, no one teach you, teaches you that in school, I think. No, absolutely. But you know what? If you're not humble, I think you will learn at some point to be, especially if you put yourself in a situation where you will need to learn to be humble. Uh, blind tasting is a very good lesson in humility. I mean, you can, it's very difficult blind tasting. At the start, it's very understand to even start to understand how you're supposed to taste the wine and then blind taste it. it it's, I mean, it takes years of practice, but it can be great fun, you know, but you have to accept that most of the time you will get it wrong or very often you will get it wrong. So, in knowing how to remain uh, grounded and, and humble. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Julie, you had like a, a, a long career, you said, um, uh, when we talked about, I'm old. sorry, I'm not that old. <laughs> no, 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 no. We... <laughs> it came, it came out uh, wrong in the wrong way. Uh, when we talked about uh, learning the, the English language, you actually uh, I, I wrote some, um, I read somewhere that you moved to to Ireland. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the reason was for you to improve your uh, English. Yes. Uh, if you can just. Uh, Take us, you know, for, from your first position as a sommelier, how it actually happened. Uh, and then basically how you moved, because uh, I read that you were a sommelier, you were, you were a head sommelier, you were a wine director, you were a wine consultant before, uh, you, were, uh, before you were a business owner. So if you can just, you know, give us like a, a highlight of those uh jumps from position to position and what what it took and what basically uh you know uh, regarding knowledge and that soft skills what it took for you to to grow in in your career um okay so i left school i was uh 20 and i i had the choice to to do another two years to you know um do more certificates to be somebody i just did for what i just did for a year and i i chose to go and work and try to work with um with a head uh, with a team and to work with the head somebody that would you know bring me and bring me along and help me and inspire me and i just thought okay you know i wanted to be like free and go to work and uh you know at 20 you're often uh, like you know i'm enough i don't want to keep on being 
Um, so I started work uh, in a two Michelin star restaurant in France, which was only open for the summer. So that's where I started. It was an amazing experience. It was a very tough experience, a very traditional restaurant. They also had a, a wine shop. So when I was working seven days a week for a month, um, because, you know, they were only open them. And, and then one by one, all the, the sommelier team just resigned. I was on my own, left with the head sommelier. So I had to do wine deliveries uh, to customers. I had to go and collect pallets of wines uh, in, a, in a small van and bring it back to the shop and to the sellers. I mean, I started with like multitasking. Yeah. Um, they put you in, into the fire, how we, we would say here. It does. And it was really hard. But you know what, at the time, I think as well the fact that very few women were sommelier when I started. Um, there was as well this desire to not show that you could crack. There was this desire to show that as a woman, I could do the job and you could ask me anything, it was going to get done. And I was carrying so much weight, you know, like cases and, and I never complained once. The more difficult it was, the more I was like, yes, I can do it, uh, which was a bit crazy at the time. But anyway, so after that, I moved to Ireland um, to improve my English. I ended up working as a assistant sommelier in a, in a two Michelin star restaurant in Dublin. I had a really, really good head sommelier there. Um, the wine list, it was a big wine list. There was around 800 or 900 uh, references on the list, mainly French wines, but also some wines from the New World and some wines from the, you know, the Italy, Spain, I would say probably Italy, Spain, and then a bit New Zealand and Aust Australia, which was totally new for me. Uh, I, I often tell that funny story. I was um, a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc from Marlborough was ordered at some at one of the tables and um, that was my first month in and I had never seen a screw cap closure in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I presented the bottle, put it back into the ice bucket, took out my wine opener and I was trying to cut the screw cap with my with the blade. <laughs> And I could see the head sommelier because he knew I, I was. I never had seen that before. Could see him in the corner of the restaurant, was like trying not to burst out laughing. And I was thinking, this is so embarrassing. I never managed to open that bottle of wine. I had to come and ask him to show me how to a bottle of screw, of open the screw cap bottle, which obviously you just twist it and it's done. So but you know, like it's all the basics that you, <laughs> you need to learn. Um, so it was, you know, it's where I started understanding that the world of wine didn't just uh, reside in, in French vineyards, that there were other things out there. Yeah, like, for example, if you go to a Bordeaux, you're not, you're just going to find Bordeaux wines, not even uh, yes. French wines from other regions, right? Exactly. And that's the beauty. Ooh, that's the beauty in Ireland. Oh, that's not a gunshot. Uh, <laughs> um, we, we don't produce wine in Ireland, uh, like not commercially anyway. So people are open-minded. Um, they drink, you know, whatever arrives on the market. Uh, there is no, oh, I only drink French or I only drink. No, people just drink so many with wines from it, all around the world. I think it's such a blessing to have that kind of uh, open-mindedness. I mean, basically not producing wine and just being open to, to anything that comes inside because, you know, all the wine countries, they're... they're they're mainly focused, of course, of course, on their local wines. But, you know, you also have room for, you know, trying other things as well. Yes. And that's, as you say, it's a blessing to, to be in this situation. So after this, I mean, I spent um, nearly two years there. And then I just decided, OK, I'll move out, uh, go to another country. I didn't spend much time there. I went to Luxembourg, Belgium, Scotland. Um, and I decided to go back to Ireland because I actually really was missing the, the culture, the energy in Dublin. Uh, it was way more relaxed in fine dining restaurants. I mean, I, I was so shocked. But people used to drink much more than in France, first of all. <laughs> so calculating a quantity of wines for for banqueting or this kind of thing was always fun. It was more like kind of double what you would plan in France. <laughs> but uh, people were so friendly. People would leave and they would give you a hug customers and that's something I would not I've, I had never seen in you know in France and I just loved it so I came back and I ended up um, 
working in, you know, like a private club, I ended up working in another fine dining restaurant, then uh, the recession of 2007, 2008 uh, hit. So restaurants were starting to close, to close one by one. I was given the opportunity to come back then as a head sommelier in the original two Michelin star restaurant where I, I had worked. Um, it was a very exciting uh, offer, but also very stressful. Um, I realize now how little I knew when I took the role. And yet, I think I did a good job, but it wasn't purely based on my level of knowledge. I think it was more based on, you know, the fact that I could um, manage the wine list properly, make sure it was up to date, manage the, the, the rotation in, in, in the cellar. The fact that I think I was good with my team and they respected me and, um, you know, we, we could make it work. The fact that I wasn't uh, afraid of, of working longer hours if we were short in staff. But um, yeah, it really, and that's when I started my diploma and oh my God, I realized how much there was to know and how, how little I knew. And and it's the same nowadays. The more I learned, the more I realized how little I knew yesterday and the day before, because it's in constant evolution. That's what's the beauty is with the world of wine. And, and you forget, you know, it's easier to forget than to study. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, we, we talked before and I told you that uh, I met uh, uh, Yurica, actually you were uh, working with Yurica Goevich, the Croatian uh, sommelier, uh, together and he told me uh, the situation that, you know, that you would have in a restaurant, for example, you know, uh, he said that Julie is a person that if she doesn't know something, you know, she will go home, she will read it, and then she will come back uh, tomorrow and said, you know, uh, she would give you the information. So you know, and just to have that again comes to humbleness, understanding what uh, what you don't know and then learning and just, you know, moving on. Yes, and even, you know, I would not be worried of telling a customer, I'm sorry, I, I don't know, or I'm sorry, actually, uh, it, it just slips out of my mind, I'll go and check for you. Because, I mean, you have two options, whether you, create a something which yeah. is going to be wrong and the customer nowadays especially with phones they can check anything and you will look uh, untrustworthy if that happens or you can admit that you don't know everything which is human yeah. and then they trust you i think yeah. if you admit that you don't know you will check and um, if you're honest with people then that's how you gain their trust and that's how you build a good relationship between customers and staff and you create you know people will come back uh, to your restaurant so when i was on, on, on a cruise ship my first contract outside of serbia for the first time first time in a, i would say you know uh, hospitality environment where you actually you know need to learn uh, different things i had my contracts for six months for six months, I would be on the table and said, my, my apologies, I don't know, let me check. My apologies, I don't know, let me check. So, and you know, uh, it gives you that uh, understanding how much things you need to know in order to come to a table and, you know, do, definitely. do a service. No, definitely. I think uh, not being afraid of meeting that you don't know or not being afraid of feeling that you're not good enough is actually very important. Uh, because there will always be people who know more than you do, who will be more specialized in the topic that you are. You could be tired on the day and, you know, you don't remember something. So, you know, you have to, you have to do your best. You have to uh, just accept that you're human. As long as you're doing your best, then just, you know, be proud of yourself and carry on and just work harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like you said, you know, you, you shouldn't be afraid of uh, working hard. Mm. because sometimes you know you need to work harder uh, than, than other days but if you enjoy what you're doing then it, you know obviously you can end up being tired when the weekend arrives or whatever but you could be tired from any other reasons you know uh, uh, here there's a lot of uh, because uh, we teach for example here WSET in, in North Macedonia and we get a lot of people that are not in the wine business they're not like, you know, high school, high school uh, people. They're, you know, people mm -hmm. in, in, you know, long years in, in their profession. And there's a, a pattern of people wanting to change their profession in middle of their life. Yes. They're bankers, they're IT people, you know, 
mm. and you know they they you know it's like an alarm built, uh, in their head saying you know like I want to get out of my, <laughs> what I'm doing now and find something more interesting uh, in life. Uh, you also, by the way, finished uh, literature, right? Yes, oh, I was going to go and I was going. I, it's it's a funny one. I I went down the high school path, the general path, uh, academic path. I was studying li studying literature and languages, and but I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, the, the, the easy and safe path was to go to university, and I was actually going to study law. Um, I I have to say I was you know I was a good student. I always had uh, it was not out of a good memory and it helped with WSET. It does, yes. But I realized that I I was I didn't want to go for this and I kind of I suppose maybe if I had a, I don't know become a lawyer so I would have had my midlife crisis and I'd be going to your school <laughs> to study with the WSET. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah my, my wife also is uh, she finished uh, literature as well. Okay. And, uh, she finished her WSET level, uh, level three uh, recently. And I said, uh, I truly uh, believe this and I'm sure this <clears throat> is most probably uh, to happen. I'm finishing my diploma. Hopefully I'll finish it uh, soon. But if she, uh, if she continues her uh, wine uh, passion, uh, she would become a, a master of wine be way before me. Me, I don't think I would even uh, try to do it because I don't have that academic uh, way of, uh, of studying. Uh, she has it and uh, that's why I, you know, I encourage her all the time. Listen, if you want, you'll become a master of wine way before me. That's, that's, that would be a great achievement. Yeah. It costs though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, you know, just to have yeah. that, uh, just for her to understand that uh, that's uh, that's her potential. Wow. Uh, cool. Uh, you were uh, the third best sommelier in the world in 2016 in Mendoza, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you also have, I just want to connect these two things together. Okay. <laughs> and also in the same time, now you're uh, a business owner. You have your own uh, business called uh, Down to Wine. Yes. Uh, if people want to, to check out, it's Down number two wine. And you have your uh, sommelier application, Som Ninja, which yes. is very cool. Very cool. <laughs> I, mean, I, I like ninjas and Vandam and all that stuff. And now I like wine. So the the combination of the <laughs> of the name some ninja is, is is perfect uh can can you can you tell us for example how uh you you have a lot of experience uh in sommelier competitions mm -hmm. uh you were also three times uh best sommelier of ireland three or four times i don't know <laughs> i read four it's maybe four. I don't. I. I love. I love to think. <laughs> it's a, It's a quite impressive uh, domination. It, it's like uh, the, there was a singer here uh, uh, called Tosha Proeski, and um, basically all the sommelier competition, you know, he would won. <laughs> and you know, and basically they would need. He would need to say, you know what? I'm not gonna compete anymore because it's it's getting ridiculous. Uh, so. Can, can you connect the, that uh, uh, sommelier competition experience, which resulted in the end as, as your part of your business? Yes, which absolutely. Is, which I think it's actually that's uh, that's uh, one of the first uh, communications that we had actually because I was uh, uh, that application is great in, in in a way that you know something that we're doing here in North Macedonia, and that's why I actually connected with you for the first time, and we started talking. Um, so yes, so I suppose uh, where, where do I start? So uh, some ninja. Um, so the the word just to kind of tell you where the name come from, it actually is linked to um, the competition in Mendoza. When I came back uh, from Mendoza, I had a small child in my family who uh, their their parents were his parents were trying to explain to him 
um, you know, oh, Julie, you know, she's a sommelier, she worked with wine, she was at a competition, blah. And so he told me, the, per the child told me, oh, you're like a wine ninja. And that's why I, we kind of laughed. So it was cute, it stayed there. And that's why we called the, app the application some ninja. Now, so I realized when I was studying uh, but not only studying, actually, even uh, when I, I have somebody contacting me who are asking me to do some online training sessions, asking questions, it's actually very hard to find database of questions um, to study. Uh, so obviously, like questions, like if you were going to pass an exam or, or competition. Um, so I had thousands of cards of flashcards that I had written um, and stored in like dozens of shoe boxes. And once I decided after the competition in Antwerp that I wasn't going to compete again, I, I still have two options, whether I put it, maybe I have three options. Maybe I put this in the attic because sentimentally I can't uh, get rid of those cards. I can just get rid of them. Uh, or I can actually use the work I've done to share it with people um, and to offer an opportunity for people who are preparing for court of mastery ex exams and competitions to actually have um, a way of training on the go. Um, so anywhere, anytime, easily, out of your pocket, on your phone. So at the moment, there are around 10,000 question cards in the uh, application. Uh, application uh, it, and we have 15 topics, so it's not just wine, there is spirits, there is tea, there are a lot of, of, um, of questions and it's, keep, it's keeping on uh, evolving. Now, I would say I'm aware that it's in three levels. The beginner level is maybe a little more challenging than that, uh, that what we thought it would be at the start. Uh, I think because um, I... Wonder, you have a high... Yes, because I suppose high. I had really high expectations with myself and maybe I lost a little bit track of, of, of the reality of where I was when I started. So we actually are in the middle of rebuilding the app application. We're going to have um, another level uh, and we will have also um, multiple choice option which means that it will be more suitable for people who are really beginning or who are also working uh, or studying more for a wct style type of exam so uh, it and we'll have more features as well so we're working on this we really appreciated all the feedback from users and so on it's very important for us so that's um that's actually i suppose where um what the application is for and uh, what, what it contains and obviously it's in constant evolution. I'm working on it every day. Uh, there is a way, uh, as you probably saw, you can query any question. So if you think it's not up to date, if you think there is a mistake, if you don't understand something, you send an email, and it's whether myself or my husband who are responding because it's a it's a it's a business, it's a house and wife for business, and we respond to everybody. Uh, and um, yeah, and so I think it's it's about building this kind of study. Uh, community of, of somebody and one students and to be very present as well it's not just we didn't hire a company to answer you know <laughs> to answer for us so to you're actually dealing with the people who created the app and uh, I think it's important and also on social media so uh, after I really enjoy the I, I, I enjoy feeling that um, it seems to have helped already some people have people contacting me with past exams and said uh, it greatly helped they even had question that ended up being in, in the exams. Uh, so yeah, it's- Maybe, it's cool. yeah, sometimes uh, I don't think, you know, like like I said on the beginning, you, you, you know, your life work is to pass this to others. Yes. You know, maybe, maybe you don't even understand how many people you touch, <laughs> how many people you inspire. Uh, it's not only the people that don't, don't, there's many people that will not even reach, reach out. But, you know, they will get inspired by, you know, the interviews that you have, the videos on, on Facebook and social media that you do. Um, I feel like that. And I know there's many, many, many others, uh, other people that, you know, see what, what you and uh, such as yourself people are doing. And it's, it's very inspiring. It's You're very inspiring. kind. It means a lot to me. Um, I was very lucky. I... I, I I worked mainly on my own for years as like I worked with a couple of somebody's, but then I ended up working on my own, the only somebody in restaurants or in a shop or, or so on. And I understand sometimes it's very hard to find the motivation to keep pushing or to understand where you are in terms of knowledge or where you need to go or need to be because you don't have a mentor, you don't have somebody there 
you know, to inspire you and push you. And then after a few years, I was actually very, very lucky. I had a Gérard Basset came to judge one of the summit, the summit competition in, 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 in Ireland. And obviously, I mean, I didn't spend a lot of time talking to him or whatever, but just a few words for him of encouragement. Um, it's like what really has made me believe that everything can happen if you work hard and that's, you need to be, be uh, to believe in yourself and you need to know that yes, there are setbacks. Yes, there be, you know, defeats or there be moments where you be down, but you just have to stand up again and, and just go again if, you know, because good things are going to happen and um and i'm so thankful to have to have had you know a few inspirational people like this humble people kind people people who were very honest and human in my you know crossing my path at some point uh, during my professional career that have given me this hope and inspiration and i really hope that through kind words through words of encouragement through sharing some knowledge, I can also contribute to make a difference to others. Yeah. Uh, you're described, I don't know who, who said this or where I, uh, where I saw it, you're described as feisty, passionate, intelligent, and warm. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I read it somewhere, <laughs> I don't know. But uh, would, you, would you say that that's true? Uh, <laughs> and remain humble <laughs> so passionate i think definitely i definitely think i'm passionate uh, feisty means like you you fight for things and you yeah for for the things that you believe oh absolutely yes i'm, I'm very strong-minded and you know what sometimes i felt in my life it would have been probably easier to just give up or not fight back on something that was even, you know, if the league very important to me or any probably brought me more trouble than anything else, but I never regretted it. I always thought saying what you think is important as long as you deliver it the right way. And um, what else? Intelligence. Well, I, <laughs> I hope, but <laughs> and what is the last, the last one? Warm. Warm. I hope so. Yes, I I hope I'm warm. I think I am. Um, and you know, part of this is probably... something. Actually, I'll, I'll say it in your name. I'll, I'll uh, something that you know that uh, actually encouraged me to to reach out uh, because it's you know it, it's not easy to 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 reach out you know to to people uh, you know like yourself that that you're busy that you're accomplished and all that. But you know, when I saw your interview on the, it was actually on on Asi the the next song generation you know it is the way that not it's not what people say it is what people say but also the way they say it mm -hmm. which you know gives you uh gives you you know that uh possibility to say you know what let me reach out let me you know mm -hmm. ask for help and guidance and you know let's see what, what's gonna happen uh it felt like this i mean you end up sometimes facing closed doors and i face closed doors i obviously you know you can be available for everything at some point you you know if you're very in a very busy moment or or so on but i really try to be as uh, responsive as possible and even if things sometimes are not possible i always reply to people i think it's really important out of respect <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, listen, I, I, I'm a proof, proof of that because I reached out and if I send you 10 messages, you answer 10 times. <laughs> if you're answering to me, you're answering to and then, like I said, thank you so much for, for, for Very being well. uh, you also had, I also read somewhere you had a situation where it was in your tr transition uh, period uh, where you were actually starting your own business and you were offered uh, a very, I would say, uh, good opportunity to work for someone. And then you explain to them that, you know, you're starting your own business. And then, you know, it's like uh, they said in a naysayers way uh, that, you know, what, you're going to make a living from this? Gosh, you really digged deep into my interviews. <laughs> well, you know, Yes, yes, I, it was. Um, it happened. Like, you don't need to go in details, but it's just, yes. it's just. Uh, that happened. 
you know, the, the things that you believe and, you know, you're willing to, to do it. Yes, exactly. No, I had, I had this like, kind of comments and um, obviously um, it's not very nice to receive those kind of words, <laughs> but you know, there are people yeah, out it's there. Not, it's not only a sunshine and rainbows. There's, you know, yeah, life yeah. is life. If you believe, if you want to do something, just go for it. If you fail, it doesn't matter because it's always a step forward because you've tried. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, okay, I don't want to, to keep you uh, too, too much <laughs> longer. Honestly, I can talk, you know, with you <laughs> all day. Uh, uh, I would like, uh, you are now the president of uh, uh, Irish Sommelier Guild. You're also the secret, uh, assistant secretary uh, to ASI. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just uh, uh, explain uh, to sommeliers, for example, how important uh, are the sommelier competitions local and also international and how it helps sommeliers to, you know, to grow? Yeah, so it's first of all, it's I think it's uh, those competitions are a fantastic networking networking platform, and you meet a lot of people along the way that probably will become friends, uh, you know, over the years, um, very you know connected colleagues that you will meet again or at some point somewhere around the world uh, of wine. Not everybody, I would say has to do competition it's a very personal investment um, not everybody wants to you know whether it's being put in the spotlight or being put under this type of of pressure because you're very stressed you know you don't do well in public or that's okay you know you don't have to do a competition to be a good sommelier this is more if you like this time this type of challenge i would say absolutely you know go for it even if you're not really prepared just go and see what it is because you will learn and you will know what to expect for the next time. You're never going to win a competition the first time. It's incredibly rare if that happens because you actually need to understand, you know, what is going to happen with the theory paper, what kind of tasks are going to be asked. You need to understand the environment you're going to be in and maybe the stress is going to have the battle of you the first time. But I think it's they are fantastic experiences. Uh, they are a good way to create um, links to meet as well, maybe somebody from your own country that you don't get to meet because, you know, a country can be quite big. <laughs> so you get to meet everybody on that specific day. Um, so no, I, I personally loved competition and I would highly recommend them if this is something you're interested in. And I, I wouldn't say just focus on the results, focus on going there, sh you know, show up, do your best, enjoy the experience, learn from it take whatever you, you know, is positive and then try it again if you enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, what would you, for example, uh, that, that's, for, that's the advice for the sommeliers. What would you advise, for example, um, uh, and maybe give a, a comparison, you know, with uh, your own association? uh how it how it was how it's now you were you know the winner uh four times of your uh competition you're now the president uh what would you advise us as a as a as a very very young association you know um how we should uh approach and build our association what's something that worked for you yeah challenges maybe that you had and it's a work in progress for me too, you know, it's a new role. Um, our association is a small association as well. Um, we, I mean, we're starting having new members. Um, we had a lot of members who were not working anymore, who were retired. So our association in terms of age, you know, group was, was quite old, uh, which we you know, which is okay. There were people who had worked for years in the industry, who ran the association, who, you know, who kept it alive. But obviously it's, it's good to see, uh, you know, younger member co members coming in because they are the people who are going to um, help you keep on keeping the association alive, um, who you want to, you know, to train and help grow and help them network and, you know, help maybe find uh, some work opportunities and so on. I suppose in terms of structure, what I think is important is um, 
you need um, to really go keep good records of, I know that us, we need to go report on, you know, members, who is a member, who is not a member. I don't know if you're working with a fee or not, but if you have a fee, you know, obviously uh, it helps keeping uh, the association sure. afloat and to try to, you know, keep on organizing events. With the pandemic, it's been challenging for everybody. Um, doing online events, it's not easy because if you have to send samples to everybody, uh, it might not be possible. I know some countries have access to a lot of miniatures. It's not something that we have. So I have to say, personally, in Ireland, we haven't been as um, active as we could. But now seeing this, for the last six months, I have a new educational committee in, in place with three people nice. who are uh, three sommeliers. And on Monday evenings, for two hours, every two Mondays, they have put together this study group. So they have a lot of uh, people who are currently studying whether for uh, the two, um, maybe I think the three first levels of the Court of Master Sommelier and some of the WC, uh, WSET levels who attend to those online, uh, online groups. They have a theme in advance, they know. So everybody, I think, buys a couple of bottles of wines uh, and they talk about it, uh, they talk about, I don't know, the specific of the terroir, the vintages, so they've been really, really good and active on this. Uh, we've tried to do some online quizzes, but it's not always easy to find, you know, the right time for everybody to have people engage, because there is also the fear of being judged if you're doing a quiz and you're not doing as well of, as someone else, so it's kind of a competition kind of setting, so it, it's sometimes a bit difficult. Um, but yes, I suppose as well, the advantage that you have as a young association within a wine producing country is that you should have no problem finding sponsors who are going to help you, um, you know, build your association, organize some events and master classes for you, uh, probably wine visits once you can travel again and, and move around again which is more difficult for us in Ireland. I mean, we could look at beer production and, and whiskey production, but we've no wine. So it's, you know, we have this challenge as well. Um, I think making sure you also listen to your members is important. Um, trying to get, you know, regular feedback from your members. What would they like to do? Um, is it a, a matter of maybe once or twice a year having, having like just a networking event, not just necessarily being studying and talking seriously about one, but just maybe having a glass of wine and, you know, sitting together and just having some casual chats and get to meet each other. Um, I think there needs to be a right balance between education, uh, competition, and uh, just socializing, networking. Cool. But lots of work, don't worry, to do us uh, on, on our side as well. So work in progress. Yeah, I, I think sometimes people just, um, uh, we focus on, on the end results but you know, it, it's never an end result. It's just you know, day to day uh, things, uh, events, like you said. You know, I, I think you just said it very well. Now you know, a little bit of competition, a little bit of education, and a little bit of just you know, so socializing and, and having fun. It's a good, uh, good, uh, good recipe. Uh, for the end, uh, some. I know that you love projects. Is there anything that you are working at the moment that, that you would like to, to, to share? I am working on the project, but I can't talk about it. <laughs> well, I do have um, a cognac project, but that's been on for a couple of years. Um, at the moment, uh, you know, with COVID, it's, everything is a little bit on hold. Obviously, my main uh, my main focus now is going to be you know some ninja for the next few months um, and years. Hopefully, um, yeah, I think one my project so is because I'm going to move back to France for a few months. Is going to spend more times uh, most time in the vineyard. I really really miss it. I want to go around and go back to tasting uh, in different parts of of, uh, of France and uh, get to meet a few more. Uh, people there, Vigneron, and uh, update my, my database of knowledge on, friend, on French wine. So that's going to be my main project for the summer, I think. The last question, your uh, dessert island wine. Oh. <laughs> it's a hard one. I think it's, it has to be a sparkling wine. Um, it has to be a sparkling wine. I don't want to mention any, uh, any brand or anything, but uh, as long as it's, uh, you know, good, 
dry sparkling wines um, with maybe some nice autolytic character that would be my kind of thing. Mm. Julie, uh, thank you so, so much for this uh, inspiring uh, interview. I wish you all the best and I wish uh, we will we'll, uh, maybe have an opportunity to meet in person uh, in, in the future and have a glass of uh, sparkling wine. Definitely, it was my pleasure, Peter, and, and, and good luck to all of you and uh, thank you for everybody uh, who is watching and, um, you know, keep believing and keep uh, following your, 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 your love for wine and uh, you'll, you'll do well. Thank you so much, Julie. Bye. Uh, cheers and uh, we'll keep in touch. Cheers. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye.